So hello everyone, welcome to this session on green finance. I am joined here by a very experienced panel uh, of composed of Masamba, Darian and Rama. And I will move right away actually to letting themselves, uh, letting them introduce themselves to us. Uh, let's start with you, Masamba. If you can give us your background, your scope, uh, and also your passion for green. Thank you, Benedict. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants. My name is Masamba Choi. I'm leading the regulatory framework implementation program within the UNFCCC Secretariat. Uh, the focus of our work is on the measurement of impact of climate action and on the development of incentive instruments for climate action. We are also exploring how innovation can best serve uh, climate. And in this regard, I'm the project executive of a new initiative launched at COP26 by the UNFCCC Secretariat, which is named the United Nations Climate Change uh, Global Innovation uh, Hub. So um, climate change is, addressing climate change is extremely important for sustainability. Uh, you cannot actually achieve the vision of peace, security, and human dignity on which the UN is founded if you do not address climate change. This is why for us, it's really extremely important uh, to address climate change. I'm very grateful to be part of this um, process working on how to address climate change. Thank you, Masamba. And uh, Darian, if you can introduce yourself to us. Thank you, Benedict, and hello everyone. It's an honor to be here today with our fellow panelists. So my name is Darian McBain. I am the Chief Sustainability Officer at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, the MAS is a regulated integrator, so it's a central bank. Uh, it also helps to develop the markets in Singapore for the financial sector. And so because it has multiple hats, it also gives a lot of scope for how we look at green and sustainable finance and how we can integrate technology into the solutions. Now, I've been working in sustainability my whole career. Uh, sadly, it was about 30 years ago that I went to university. Now, I look back, I studied environmental engineering and where I studied in Australia, it was the first time environmental engineering was offered and nobody was quite sure what environmental engineers would do. Uh, might have been building green bridges but you know, my career has evolved as I think the sustainability field has evolved. And I've spent a lot of time working in supply chains. I've worked across government, intergovernment, non-government for myself, and then most recently for a large food producer in Southeast Asia before moving to the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And partly why I made that move was because I could see that finance is really starting to move the needle particularly on climate change and so we've been talking about climate change all that time i've been working in the industry but now that we look at the scale of investment in whether it's renewables or innovation adaptation and mitigation the things that we need to now start funding i can see that green finance and sustainable finance really can have an impact and so that's really the aspect that i'm coming from what can a central bank do and what role can it play to really enable a low carbon transition and a sustainable future? That's great. And thank you for your background. Uh, it's, it's indeed probably one of the longest standing, although uh, maybe Masama is equally uh, long standing. So Rama, over to you, uh, if you can introduce yourself and your passion for green. Sure, I'm, I'm definitely the contrasting person with a more limited experience on the topic. Um, so I, I work at JP Morgan, uh, based in New York. Um, I run what we call our Center for Carbon Transition or CCT globally. Uh, that group itself is only about two years old, though I've been at JP Morgan about 20 years uh, as an investment banker. What we do at the CCT is uh, is kind of two different, two quite related things actually. One is my team is responsible for 
designing and implementing JP Morgan's climate related uh, commitments as it pertains to our client business. And I can talk more about that. We have a Paris alignment commitment. We have a two and a half trillion dollar sustainable and green finance commitment. We are now part of the net zero banking alliance, et cetera. So that's one half of what we do. And related to that, uh, what we also do is engage with our clients globally. Uh, because really, at the end of the day, our climate commitments are contingent on our clients' climate commitments. And only if our clients transition their business model to a lower carbon state can we claim to have achieved our own commitments. So I spent a lot of my time uh, talking to our clients, as I said, globally across all different sectors um, on their current climate credentials, their plans for um, decarbonizing their business model, etc. So very, very pleased to be here. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. It's obviously a wealth of experience that we have here in the room. And just to quickly introduce myself, uh, I will be the moderator for this session, and I'm Benedict Nolans. Uh, and currently, I am the head of the BIS Innovation Hub Hong Kong Centre. Uh, and we have been working, amongst others, on, on green projects, but also on other projects. Um, and like Darian, actually, my interest uh, for green started a very long time ago. And like you, I actually, uh, at the time I did, I, I'm a lawyer. So I did a course in environmental law and it was the time where there was no jobs in the field. So I had to pivot to finance in general. Um, and I'm glad actually to be back to the topic. So I'm glad that we're at the phase of, of the evolution of finance where people really care about the topic. Um, and I think the very fact that we're all three uh, engaged in it shows how important of, of a topic it has become. So uh, maybe Masama, I want to start it off with you. And, and uh, from a UN perspective, if anything, the UN has been the longest standing fighter really on the topic of climate change uh, with, with now coming to COP26, which means that there was 26 years before it. Uh, so I wanted to ask you how far you think the international collaboration has come on the topic of climate change. Uh, and you may feel free to comment on the international collaboration under the Paris Agreement, uh, as well as what was achieved in COP2026 20, and what you're looking forward to uh, in the future. I, I think uh, you're on mute, Masamba. Thank you, Benedict. Um, uh, in terms of collaboration, there is a lot of things that has been accomplished, um, particularly from um, the Paris Agreement um, until uh, COP26 at, at Glasgow. So in terms of international collaboration, we have seen the implementation of uh, market mechanism where countries with commitment and countries with uh, without commitment or um, let's say collaborating um, before uh, Paris. And uh, after Paris, we have seen um, collaboration through the different means of implementation, collaboration on finance with um, uh, developed countries, countries committing to provide uh, 100 billion uh, dollar by 2020 to the global south. And then we have also seen collaboration in terms of uh, technology transfer, as well as um, uh, capacity building. Um, however, where I think there is room for further implementation uh, and, and uh, further, let's say, improving um, in terms of collaboration is the fact that um, all these collaboration are undertaken still with the mindset of problem uh, solver. So it means that um, the different entities are focusing on how they can reduce their own GSG emission reduction. So what we are really uh, expecting to see moving forward is a change of mindset where the different entities, be it countries or uh, corporate or subnational, moving from, um, let's say, this problem solver mindset 
to a solution provider mindset where it's not just about how I can reduce my own emission, but it's more about how can I develop solution that can also help others reduce their own emission. That's a very important aspect. And in terms of collaboration, maybe it's also important to touch upon collaboration within uh, countries because this can sometimes it is one of the main bottleneck. So what we are expecting to see is multi-level type of climate action with uh, um, vertical collaboration between national government and sub-national government. What happens very often is that at the national level, you have a nationally determined contribution, uh, which is setting the objective of the country and the strategy of the country to reduce emission. But then this nationally determined contribution is not uh, linked or aligned with uh, sub-national strategies or sectoral strategies. It is very frequent that the nationally determined contribution developed by the Ministry of Environment is not aligned, for example, with the strategy to develop the energy sector. And uh, this is a problem. So it's why this um, vertical collaboration between national government and uh, uh, sub-national government, city government, as well as and a horizontal collaboration between the different ministries is extremely important for successful implementation of the uh, NDCs of different countries. And uh, finally, one, one important element is that we need to move, uh, to be able to move from this um, a problem solver approach to a more solution provider approach, we need to have clarity on what are the demand for climate and sustainability solution. So it means that the countries need to um, translate the gap between their uh, ambitious target objective and commitment and what they perceive as possible, that gap need to be translated into a demand for climate and sustainability solution, other countries can respond to by providing different type of uh, support. And this demand for climate and sustainability solution finally need to be integrated. So, so far we have seen collaboration on specific issue, isolated. So collaboration on finance, collaboration on technology or collaboration on capacity building. And very often what we are seeing is um, you need to have a more integrated approach where the need in terms of technology, finance, capacity building, and, and um, institutional arrangement are taken holistically, and then collaboration is undertaken to address this need at the, at the global level. So it requires to have access to a lot of data, data at the level of the country, but let the data also at the sub-national level as well as at the, um, at the level of corporate. So if all these data are available and uh, translated into demand for climate and sustainability solution, then we can have what I will call a radical collaboration in terms of climate action. Thank you, Masamba. There was uh, a lot in, in this reply. So, uh, Darian, maybe to, to uh, pass it over to you, uh, in preparation for this panel, you had mentioned that to address data challenges and, and also to avoid greenwashing, we need common definitions for the activities that contribute to climate goals. Uh, and that in turn can help determine which data is important to obtain. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on what you mean with this? Sure, thank you. And, and I think it builds well on what Masamba was speaking about. So one thing that we've seen the evolution of, particularly in the past few years, is taxonomies and taxonomies that will really signpost which activities uh, are green, so they are low carbon activities, 
or they're somewhere in the scale towards brown, which tends to be the fossil fuel intensive activity, so high carbon activities. And the taxonomies were developed so that you could have a common language across countries and across industries so that you could signpost investment in more sustainable activities, particularly around infrastructure. Now, there's actually been a plethora of taxonomies that have been developed. The European Union and uh, the Chinese taxonomies are probably the most commonly recognised, but I think at current count there's around 23 different taxonomies. So there's an ASEAN taxonomy, uh, Singapore is developing a taxonomy along with uh, its financial institutions, and so once you get to the level of multiple taxonomies, it perhaps becomes a little bit more confusing again. And that's where we see that technology can help to play a role as well in that you can look at the equivalence between those different taxonomies. What we're also seeing is the development of sectoral pathways. And so a taxonomy will tend to go across a whole economy and signpost whether something is green or brown, whether you should invest or perhaps consider at a more granular level what a particular company or asset owner is doing. Whereas the sectoral approach is looking you know, in one sector, but it could be across multiple countries. Uh, a good example would be, say, the Poseidon principles for a maritime shipping sector, which is looking at the target for decarbonisation set by the International Maritime Organisation. So how the whole shipping sector can move together essentially towards that decarbonisation goal. Another collaboration, particularly between financial institutions uh, and it's a global approach again, is fast infra. So looking at how can we really scale up the speed of investment in not just green and sustainable infrastructure, but how can you get down to the more granular level to see is this project going to take us in the right direction to, let's say, science-based targets or towards net zero? And at the moment, the scale and the speed of investment perhaps isn't fast enough. We saw from the latest IPCC report that you know there are some very you know, bad consequences, which uh, we're all starting to feel already, and that we know the closer we get to 1.5 degrees C warming, potentially the worse those impacts will be. And so how can we really speed up finance? So part of it is through this naming. Part of it is through having faster processes to identify this sector or these particular companies are decarbonising. We need to have a way that we can compare and gather the data and then how we can start to look at the impacts. So it's one thing to say that we have trillions of dollars going into sustainable finance or sustainable bonds or sustainability linked loans. But we need to have enough data and enough granularity of that data to be able to build it from the ground up to see is that really contributing towards the targets that we want under the Paris Declaration. Thank you. That's very useful. And, and we'll get back to the data points a little bit later in terms of the green print and also uh, picking up on some of the points that Masamba has raised in terms of NDCs and maybe ITMOs. Uh, but first, I want to turn it to, to, to Rama as well. And, and I want to understand your bank perspective on how you are expecting to evolve uh, in terms of climate financing towards the net zero targets. So um, let's see, what changes have you seen in, in a global bank like JP Morgan in terms of focus on this topic? And what are your primary um, focus area in terms of, of uh, achieving this goal? Um, sure, thanks, Benedict. So lots of changes, as I said, um, you know, two, three years back, I was doing something quite different. And uh, I'll use JP Morgan just as representative. I do think this is uh, a very um, secular trend uh, across all banks. And apologies, my dog has a viewpoint on this too, it seems like. Um, the, the banks have gone through a stage over the last 18 to 24 months of having done a couple different things. I think very consistent. One is most global banks now have a, a target to align their financing business with clients to net zero. You know, we started with the Paris alignment target and then we now are part of the net zero banking alliance and hence have a kind of a net zero commitment, right? I think again, most global banks have started with a version of that. 
Um, and then what most banks have also done is put out commitments on the other side to either directly finance or facilitate green investments. Right? Uh, I mentioned right in the beginning of my introduction that at JP Morgan, we have a commitment to either finance or facilitate two and a half trillion dollars over the next decade on sustainable and green projects or companies, of which at least a trillion dollars will be in green projects. Right? That's our commitment. Again, most global banks have a commitment like that. The quantums might might be different. The definitions might be different to Darian's point. You know, there is no commonality of, you know, what's considered green, what's considered good versus not so good, right? So that confusion exists. But directionally, I think every, every financial institution is um, aligned that the industry as a whole has to do its part, right? It's very clear that this transition to 1.5 degrees is, it's going to be, um, very capital intensive, right? Um, whether it's $2 trillion a year or $5 trillion a year, we can debate based on kind of assumptions, but it's going to be capital intensive. And so banks as um, financial intermediaries, uh, as one direct providers of capital, but also as facilitators, right? Connecting capital seekers with capital, other capital providers, we have a very important role to play. So I... I'm, you know, I talk to my counterparts and peers at other banks who are all kind of, you know, doing something very similar to what we are trying to do at JP Morgan. I think there is a, a lot of uh, consistency in thought process and philosophy that we need to do our part. And at JP Morgan, as I said, we we have we started within in the fall of 2020, we put out a, a commitment to Paris Align our financing book. And what we did was we started with the three most uh, carbon intensive sectors in our portfolio, oil and gas, autos and power, and then went through a process of measuring the carbon footprint of all the clients in all of these sectors, and then came up with a 2030 target at the portfolio level for each of these sectors, um, and we published it. And then since then, we have implemented essentially this methodology or framework in our decision making process. So. Um, when now a client in one of these sectors comes to JP Morgan for help with a financing transaction, we actually make carbon and input into the decision making, whether we want to help that, uh, that client do the transaction or we want to guide them to do something different or, you know, potentially even, you know, not participate at all, right? Uh, those decisions are always kind of, you know, um, influenced by multiple factors, right? What's the credit quality of the client? What's the profitability of the transaction? Are there reputational risks involved, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, carbon is a factor as well, an explicit factor. So, again, I, I think we are one of the first banks who have actually implemented a methodology like that. But I am, uh, you know, I know for a fact that every bank is, you know, on a very similar trajectory at this point. Thank you very much. So I wanted to, to get back to Darian on, on this question, actually. So you'd mentioned as well that the MES obviously does uh, green stress testing as well. Um, and I wanted to maybe get your insight as to um, how, how intense that practice is becoming uh, to in some test um, banking books and, and see how green our, our brand they are. And also whether you use any specific um, data or technology tools or whether you you instead um, place reliance on, on the data that, that the banks uh, have developed. Sure, so I think the data underlies all of that decision making. And so that fundamentally puts data at the heart of any future scenarios that we're looking at. And so, MAS, but also working with the Network for the Greening of the Financial System, which is a collaboration of uh, over 100 different organisations, mainly central banks around the world, um, has developed a number of climate scenarios to really test the thinking and the robustness of uh, how we're managing uh, books, but also what those risks to the system are. And so as a central bank, we have a number of tools and it could be through regulations, it could be through a risk management approach. Uh, we can get further data through requiring disclosures, um, particularly climate related disclosures. Uh, and then there's the stress testing that we can do. But one thing that's interesting about, uh, I guess, a lot of economic models versus what we're doing with climate change is that 
often with economic models, you're basing your assumptions and your decisions on historic data. But what we actually know is that with climate change, we need to be future facing. And so this is where technology can really play a role. And so as we gather data, we can use machine learning and AI to start to consider what are those future impacts that may be felt with this particular range of data. And I think that is really an exciting opportunity to really get to the modeling. Um, but then one of the projects that we've started on that I can speak a little bit more about is Project Greenprint, which is how do we get to all of that data? Because so the central banks don't hold that data. So financial institutions will hold it, and generally that data is then coming from their customers or others. And so how can you start to bring together all of these disaggregated data sets so that it can form one coherent system and then you can start to look at well, what impact are we having and what are the likely scenarios that we see in the future. So it really is a mixture of a number of tools that we can use as a central bank, um, but technology is definitely enabling us to go further and perhaps faster with our analysis. Great, thank you. So, uh, Masamba, just to connect back to what you said in the beginning, so you spoke about local data, you spoke about the, the national data, um, and then, you know, overlaying that is the Paris Agreement objectives. So, my question to you is, how how is that going to be added up? It's it's already quite difficult, as, as we just discussed, to monitor a banking book of a specific bank. So, so how do you think, how do you see this evolve, um, the compliance with the Paris Agreement and the reporting around it? And, and also what technologies are, are you seeing uh, being used or, or that the UN is exploring in this regard? So data is critical, modeling is um, critical, building scenario is critical if you want to achieve the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement. So first of all, at the planning phase, when we are setting goal and target, uh, data play an important role. Um, if you want to have commitment and target that are aligned with the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement, the general approach is to start with this global goal, longer-term global goal, and use a backcasting normative scenario to translate them into, let's say, objective for now and, and, and for a specific location or a specific jurisdiction. Um, this is about what the longer term uh, global climate goal means for me as an entity and, and today, what type of action I should undertake and what type of objective I, I need to, to have. And then when implementation is taking place, data also is absolutely needed, as well as uh, when um, after implementation to measure the climate contribution or the impact of uh, the climate action. So one important element uh, which is quite new um, is that more and more we would like also to measure the impact of an enabling entity. What is the climate contribution of an enabling entity? So you are not reducing your own emission, but as I have said at the beginning, you are a solution provider. You are a financier facilitating the implementation of climate action, or you are, you are a technology provider facilitating the implementation of climate action. How your uh, contribution can be um, measured. This requires a lot of data uh, simply because the, the one who is undertaking the climate action is different from the entity within the boundary of which the impact of the climate action will, will materialize. And finally, all these things need to be aggregated at the global level to be able to track our global progress toward the global long-term Goal. So, of course, all these things cannot be done. Any of these things can be can uh, can can be done, cannot be done without um, leveraging the new digital technology. So, IoT in particular, 
the distributed leadership technology, including blockchain and artificial intelligence has a key role to play, as well as uh, data, um, mobile data and, uh, and um, cloud computing. We expect this digital technology combined to be able to facilitate, let's say, the collect and, and processing of the data necessary for setting the right goal, for implementing the right climate action, measuring the impact, and tracking progress towards the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. I think that's a very good point. Obviously, all these technologies uh, are useful for, for green. And uh, I, I guess the question is, there will be so many providers and sources for these data at some stage that that the question is, will one become more prevalent or more dominant than the other? So, um, Rama, maybe to come back, uh, back to you. So, JP Morgan, obviously, aside from providing financing, uh, also as a, as a huge asset management and wealth management customer base. So I wanted to ask, do you see a lot more focus of your uh, wealth and your asset manager investors, sorry, asset management uh, investors on, on the topic of ESG, green transparency, et cetera, or, or even, you know, focused investment into the space? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um... This is true uh, both for the investment banking business and the asset and wealth management business. I think the catalyst or primary catalyst is really the, the behavior of asset owners, right? The asset owners, the pension plans, the sovereign wealth funds, et cetera, are absolutely keen on the topic. And so whether you are an asset manager or you're an issuing client who we would deal with in the investment bank, you know, you are being influenced by the asset owners, right? The asset owners think of the asset managers as, you know, important catalyst and change agents. And so as an asset manager ourselves, we clearly have to make sure that we take the preferences of the asset owners into account in what products do we offer, right? So there's a lot of interesting product development work we have done in our asset management business. <clears throat> That's true again in the institutional space, but also in the private world space where lots of kind of uh, private uh, wealth clients also are increasingly keen on the topic, increasingly want to make sure that we offer a set of products for their investment needs that satisfy not just financial return expectations, but also have some other kind of, you know, green characteristics, right? So I think that is absolutely a trend. Um, they're also very keen to also, just like, you know, everyone else is keen to also understand through use of data and some of the technologies that Masama and Darin you know, were talking about on the profile of their investments, right? So they're, they're asking us to give them as accurately as possible what the carbon footprint of their investment portfolio might be and what the trajectory of their investment portfolio companies might be, right? So there is a lot of uh, work being done, I would say, from, from JP Morgan's perspective on the banking side, but also on the asset and wealth management side, again, both on the institutional side as well as on the um, on the private wall side. The other thing I'll make is, you know, as an asset manager, not only do we have the ability to uh, to invest dollars, keeping in mind these preferences, but also, uh, you know, as a passive asset manager, uh, uh, you may also have the ability to influence voting, right? You know, you can you can uh, vote on ESG related issues or climate related issues in a manner to advance your objectives, right? So, both that kind of you know voting mechanism and actual invested investing dollars mechanism is are powerful tools and I think all asset managers are using both. I think we're seeing more of that, right? More activism by by investors, maybe not by yourselves, but I see it uh, a little bit more from from uh, from companies that are larger holders in in specific stocks and then are more activist than they used to be before. Uh, so, Darian, I want to do a little bit dig into your past because you said that you you were in supply chain management, and there is a ton of focus on supply chains, and and in particular, they are actually great sources of data and information. Um, there's also attempts to combine that with blockchain and and to create this provenance transparency in in supply chains. 
So I wanted to just um, get your perspective on that. Do you, do you see a strong future in that? And if you needed to predict the future, how would you see it? Um, you know, personally, I was wondering if someday I just go to supermarket and I, I not only see the barcode and the contents of, of, of the thing, let's say the can, but also I can maybe scan and see its origins, for example, where these tomatoes come from and, and whether they were farmed in sustainable, sustainable fashions, etc. Do you think that is a far away future or is that something you, you will see evolve based on expectations and demand from, from the customers, in this case, the consumers? Well, depending on where you are in the world, you can do that right now and really? on the product. Yes, you can. So. I used to work for one of the largest seafood processors in the world. And if I take the example of a can of tuna, um, the brand John West actually introduced a can tracker probably 15 years ago now, where you could put in a code that was on the can that would tell you the journey that the fish had taken. So you could go to which ocean it was caught in, which vessel, um, the type of fishing and the type of fish that was in the can. But of course, technology has really driven that ahead. And so now you see all of that information can be collected electronically. So one of the things we were doing at Thai Union before I left was working with the vessel owners to install electronic monitoring on those vessels. And in a way, you can think of that as like closed circuit television plus satellite data all tied up on a fishing vessel. And so you can automate the collection of data such as the catch location uh, and then you can see if it's legal or illegally fished. You can work out the gear type, you can work out the species of fish. So there's technology that will look at, let's say if you're using a, a big net, it can scan what you've caught to see is it all this type of fish, let's say skipjack or yellowfin tuna, or are there protected species in there? Have you accidentally caught a turtle, for example? Um, you can look at the winch weight so that you can match that to the records that are being kept, um, going back to this concept of illegal fishing. Uh, and all of these details can then, if you want, be sent through a blockchain process. So I know some European brands will have uh, a blockchain verified uh, traceability program that you can have for your canned tuna. Now, there's a lot of data involved in all of that. In fact, too much. And when I used to work with some of the big retailers, say some of the very large US retailers, and they said, just give us everything. Well, actually, you don't want everything. There is so much data that's there. And so what we need to have is useful data, and we need to be able to make it comparable and to look at, well, what are we trying to prove? Is it impact maybe going back to one of uh, Rama's points you know what are you trying to actually do with this particular investment for example are you trying to prove that it's going towards net zero are you trying to prove that it meets some of the UN sustainable development goals so we need to think about with all of this data and all of the technology how are we going to harness that power of technology to actually make better decisions and that's very important in the financial sector, and I say this as a regulator looking across all different financial institutions, how can you make the data comparable and how can you actually use that data to inform decisions? And so I'd say we need to look to supply chains. That's where the information is. We need to look at uh, fintech companies, any kind of tech company that makes it easier to get that data and put it in a platform where you can actually compare it. And then what are we going to do with that data? So we should never be asking for data that we're not going to use, but how do we put it into a format that's usable and comparable? And then we can use it to have disclosures so that uh, people like JP Morgan and Rama can actually pick up that data and make informed decisions on that basis. And ultimately their investors or consumers at the supply chain um, can make their own purchasing decisions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I, I didn't know the future was already here. So that's the future's it. here. Okay. <laughs> so Masawa, maybe I want to pass it back to you and on a question um, on public and, and private sector uh, collaboration. 
obviously we collaborated together on, on project Genesis 1.0, which was to tokenize government green bonds with the view of distribution to retail and giving the retail investors transparency on the use of proceeds, uh, as well as on um, on, on asset, the, the green outputs of that use of proceeds. So um, we're now evolving together with you to, to defining uh, Genesis 2.0. Um, and as a more general matter, I wanted to, to get your thoughts on the collaboration opportunities between the private and public sector. How important do you think it is to, to achieve those pur purposes um, that, that you as, as the UN uh, oversee and, and specifically that were agreed as part of the Paris Agreement? Um, thank you. So this collaboration between private and public sector is um, very important to um, um, achieve the sustainability and, and climate goal. Um, this is because they have uh, they, are, they have some uh, to a large extent they are, they have synergy. And, and each of the two complement uh, the other entity. Um, the private sector have the financial resources that are um, required to address these challenges. And uh, the public sector can actually uh, put in place the right uh, policy framework and then the institutional arrangement that will um, combined with the resources provided by the private sector, help um, address this um, important um, challenge. So, um, but all these things will require to, to um, plan and, and to measure um, uh, impact. So in the case of, of Genesis, for example, it's, um, it has been um, really interesting to um, explore possibility of leveraging um, technology such as um, blockchain to um, facilitate um, the use of um, financial instrument that can uh, be inclusive in the sense that here uh, it was not only, um, let's say, important financial that were targeted, but also um, retail um, investors. So the fact that um, participation were, were, were made possible even at the most granular level, at the level of individual citizen, I think was really something um, important. And uh, the fact that there are transparency and, and also reduction of transaction costs was uh, something very much um, progress, uh, an important um, progress. But um, um, beyond, beyond um, uh, Genesis, there are some other applications that could be also extremely important for um, this um, digital technology, uh, particularly when it comes to measuring uh, climate contribution. Um, and, and, and there, if you want the participation of the private sector uh, to this um, global challenge, we need to be able to measure their impact and, uh, and recognize such impact. Um, so if it is a financial or a technology provider, we need to measure their net contribution to, to climate action in, in, the, in the case of technology provider, it means that we need to measure um, the carbon footprint of the product that they are providing, as well as the carbon um, handprint um, or what are the positive externality that the, the product is, is creating. And going back to um, what was said just before, if you have um, um, to, be measure, to be able to measure the carbon footprint, you will need to go back to um, the supply chain and undertake uh, life cycle analysis, tracking the product to rebuild 
uh, its uh, history and, and determine the carbon content. There also the digital technology in particular DLT will have a key role to play. Yeah. So I think overall, um, I think the message uh, we've heard in this panel and we're getting to the final five minutes, I think the message is loud and clear that we need to really harness, as Arian said, the power of technology. And as, as Masamba said, it is quite a wide variety of, of current technologies that we have available, including use of cloud, very important for the size of the data we're talking about. Uh, the application of AI, the application of IoT, which again, you know, AI may be, may be used to analyze it. Uh, blockchain, again, as a rail for provenance of data checking, uh, and, and again, can be combined uh, with, with AI. And I would guess uh, many, many other um, evolution in technology and in data analytics that we will see. So uh, with this, I just wanted to give everyone maybe just uh, less than a minute to, to uh, say what, what you would uh, leave as a message to our audience, um, which presumably are from the banking community. So uh, maybe Darian, first uh, over to you. Okay, well, maybe to use your words, the, the future is here. So I think we have <laughs> some great technological solutions but what we need to do is to really start to use them to have a purpose. And I guess my passion is that we can measure impact. So whether it's climate change, whether it's across the spectrum of the sustainability development goals, it's how can we use that data to make better informed decisions? How can we make our data collection cross-jurisdictional as well as cross industry so that we can go from the very granular level and build up a full picture from the ground up because we know that these very large problems whether it's climate change whether it's biodiversity loss it is no one country it's no one company it is actually our collective action that is going to really make a difference it's a global challenge uh, so rama over to you Sure. So maybe a couple um, points in reaction to the previous comments. <clears throat> I think one, I would say the importance of uh, the public policy um, in all of this cannot be cannot be overstated, right? <clears throat> the appropriate in, you know incentive structures to facilitate capital flows to the right pockets of the economy, I think, is very important. We've seen that, especially in the U.S., right, with you know incentives for solar and wind, and now carbon capture, etc. I think again, more public policy to incentivize capital flows is a massive thing. Uh, <clears throat> better disclosure standards would be you know critical overall, right? So we talked a lot about data, but the reality is there is the climate data which we have a lot of and a reasonable handle on. There is financial data which we have a very good handle on. But the quality and consistency of emissions data is actually very poor today. Right? So any public policy measures to kind of, you know, encourage better disclosure around emissions globally in a consistent manner would be massive. Right? The way I at least I think about it is, you know, better disclosure will lead to better assessment of a particular company's footprint and, you know, uh, uh, attributes and better assessment will lead to better valuation and that will lead to better capital flows, right? So public policy to encourage all of that will be, I think, will be critical. Um, and then the, the the notion of technology, I think, which is clearly there is the industrial technology where we are all very focused on how we can facilitate, right, whether it's carbon capture or green hydrogen, et cetera. I think that holds the key to the, to the puzzle here, right? We know that we need many of these technological things to work out, but some of the other kind of technologies that have been mentioned here, right, are critical to the... The one thing I would maybe slightly cautious note is not to get maybe too caught up in the technology, um, the, the power of some of these technologies, right, to solve the problems. I mean, the blockchain, which, you know, it's fantastic, but the reality is the blockchain can be pretty carbon intensive itself. So let's, let's be a little thoughtful in what technologies we deploy to make sure that we are not exacerbating a problem, something we think about a lot too. So I'll stop with that. 
Thank you, Rama. I agree with that. That's a point we failed to touch upon is the carbon intensity of these new technologies. Maybe that's a good topic for the next panel. So, uh, Masamba, just a few seconds over to you. Yes, in 20 seconds. So I think what I would like to stress is the important role of the finance sector. So it has been said at the beginning, but I would like to reiterate that. Uh, so we need to be able to measure their climate contribution and incentivize their action. I think we're right on time. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for this uh, fantastic uh, panel. And I said you have obviously a wealth of experience. So hopefully uh, we talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.